um, yeah, Bill, that presentation was incredibly scary. Um, and how about we just leave the fossil fuels in the ground instead? That would be my suggestion. <laughs> so that brings us really nicely to what I want to talk about. I'm going to attempt to share my slide. And cool, is that working? Great. Um, can I move? There we go. So yeah, as Andrew says, I've been um, part of the campaign to end fossil fuel sponsorship of cultural institutions um, since 2012, although it's a campaign that's been going on um, for quite a lot longer than that. Um, and I haven't really got time to sort of talk you through the whole campaign. Um, so I'm going to focus on a few of the what I think are the big reasons that it's been such a successful campaign of late. Um, and then focus on the specific example of the Science Museum Group um, to spark a bit of discussion about how we can more effectively drive positive institutional change. Um, so obviously, as we've already mentioned, you know, the strategy, the whole reason for doing this work, the whole reason for this campaign is challenging oil companies' social license to operate wherever they are shaping it, um, because we know that the reserves and currently operating oil and gas fields will take the world beyond 1.5 degrees. Um, we need to transition rapidly away from fossil fuels, but we know that oil and gas companies have very effectively cultivated a social license to operate that allows them to continue driving up emissions, lobbying against effective climate measures, shifting blame and responsibility elsewhere, and so on. Um, and that's why we've seen campaigns like the fossil fuel divestment movement really spring up to, in an attempt to sort of remove that legitimacy um, from the industry, reduce its powers with the aim of freeing up political and economic space that we need for transition. Um, and this campaign is kind of part of that movement uh, because oil companies, particularly BP, but others as well, have relied very heavily on cultural sponsorship to boost their social license. So that's kind of why we're here in this space. Um, so in terms of the kind of things that get sponsored by Big Oil, um, you may or may not be aware of this. So there's the BP Big Screens, it's part of the World Opera House. Uh, BP uh, sponsors blockbuster exhibitions at the British Museum, very, very high profile. Uh, there's the BP Portrait Awards, has been running for nearly th over 30 years. Um, and most recently, Wonder Lab, um, the new interactive um, gallery for children at the Science Museum is the Statoil Gallery, or now the Equinor Gallery, because they've rebranded that same company. Um, so, um, yeah, I won't go through the whole campaign. I'm going to skip to the good stuff, which is the, the kind of catalogue of wins that we've had over the last few years, um, just to show that this campaign is really kind of having an impact. So maybe the biggest recent one was the Royal Shakespeare Company ending its sponsorship deal with BP halfway through the contract and actually giving the money back. Um, and that happened last year, but we've actually seen, you know, ever since 2016, when Tate didn't renew its contract with BP, we've seen a lot of different cultural institutions end their relationships um, with oil and gas companies. Um, so this is a list of them and the years that, that those um, contracts have ended. And I'll draw your attention to the Edinburgh Science Festival, because that was the first organisation that actually cited climate change and their responsibilities as a scientific and educational organisation in their decision um, to no longer accept money from Exxon and a couple of other companies. So that was really significant. Um, so how has this movement uh, been so successful? I'm going to draw on a couple of what I think are maybe the, the biggest lessons that might be usefully applicable to the kind of conversations that we're having today. Um, first of all, and it's already been mentioned, creativity and storytelling are such powerful tools. Um, so the next few slides are a few examples of um, the activist theatre group BP or Not BP, of which I am part, um, performing in cultural spaces. Uh, we always perform without permission, without warning. Um, we take the space um, and we use it to talk about climate change, what oil companies are really doing and trying to sort of catalyse a debate. Um, so we kind of, we see it, our role as 
bringing the debate about the kind of actions that we need to be taking in the face of, of climate breakdown out of the science and the policy sphere and into the cultural sphere, uh, very much meeting people where they are in cultural institutions and cultural spaces where they are already engaged and open and, and kind of interested in ideas and having conversations um, and also reaching a whole new audience with these kinds of arguments um, that's been very effective. Um, so we try and find ways of talking about these issues that are attention grabbing, that are innovative. So this is a, a big action we did a few years ago. These are all umbrellas spelling out a big no in the British Museum, Great Court. Um, you know, we try and come up with ways of communicating that, that aren't that aren't dry, but that also aren't terrifying, um, that engage, that use humour. Um, so this was the, the BP Kraken that we smuggled in its constituent parts into the British Museum, along with some uh, BP pirates when BP sponsored the Sunken Cities exhibition, which was a bit of a messaging gift, really. Um, so we had quite a lot of fun with that. Um, uh, you know, we also do performances that really allow expression of passion and emotion and the kind of deep feelings that we all have about the climate crisis. Um, and that really kind of connects and resonates with people. Um, and we also do actions that, where we try and allow mass participation in creative acts. So rather than audiences being um, observers, we try and find ways of them being participants in these spaces. Um, and uh, we've had a huge amount of media coverage because of these sort of attention grabbing activities that has really kind of catalyzed um, a big debate. Um, and our most recent uh, big performance just before lockdown in February, we had over 1,500 people coming to the British Museum um, over a space of three days to take part in workshops and performances culminating in a mass moment of a thousand people ripping up the BP logo in the Great Court. It was incredibly powerful. Um, uh, yeah, so we also um, joined the dots to the wider justice issues such as decolonization and Black Lives Matter, huge debate in the cultural sector at the moment, particularly in the museum sector about what we do about our colonial legacy. Um, and we also very much link up with the, the youth climate movement. So it's a kind of more diverse and dynamic movement than a lot of kind of traditional green campaigns have been in the past. Um, and we've always kind of felt like we've got a very powerful response by using the medium that's being sponsored to challenge it. So you know, BP sponsors Shakespeare, we jump up on stage with an anti-BP soliloquy wearing doublet and hose. Uh, BP sponsors the Troy exhibition, we make a giant uh, Trojan horse, sneak it into the British Museum courtyard and then occupy the courtyard for three days and use that as a focal point for this massive action. Um, so that's, that's been, um, I think, one of the reasons why we've kind of got so much attention and so much participation. Um, so the second lesson um, has been about building coalitions beyond traditional campaigns. So some of the most powerful interventions in the oil sponsorship debate have actually come from within the cultural sector and within the institutions that are being sponsored. Um, so just a few examples, um, Oscar winner and, and national treasure, Mark Rylance, um, resigned as a Royal Shakespeare Company associate artist with a very impassioned article in the Guardian um, that got a huge amount of coverage at the time and definitely kind of catalyzed amongst other things the decision by the RSC to move away from BP. Um, artist Gary Hume decided to speak out against BP sponsorship of the BP Portrait Award even though he was a judge of the BP Portrait Award on the day that the awards were announced because he'd had this kind of moment of clarity seeing Extinction Rebellion and realised that actually he had a responsibility to speak out um, and that had huge impact and he was then joined by a lot of very prominent portrait painters and Turner Prize winners and the artistic community kind of mobilised around him calling for the end of BP sponsorship of the Portrait Award. Um, Egyptian author Akhtaf Suev um, resigned as a British Museum trustee last year uh, with a very heartfelt article in the London Review of Books, uh, essentially citing the museum's intransigence on BP sponsorship, but also on their treatment of workers and their lack of engagement with their colonial legacy and making links between all of those. And that obviously kind of sent shockwaves through the museum sector. Um, and that was followed by the British Museum 
union branch of the PCS actually publicly first supporting her resignation and then after we did the big BP must fall Troy um, action they put out a public statement supporting that as well um, so that's been incredibly powerful so I think that interplay between external activism and internal advocacy has been a really crucial dynamic because um, activists can kind of can catalyze an internal or a sector-wide conversation which otherwise might not happen and actually make it possible for people to have internal conversations that they've been wanting to have but feel under a lot of pressure not to have um, and so we've worked really closely with and continue to with a lot of people on the inside um, who are looking for ways to push their organizations in the right direction and i, I think that's also really important practice to check that we're getting our framing right uh, we're not doing or saying anything that is counterproductive or undermining already existing initiatives so that's really really important as well so on to lesson three, the less positive one about how some of these corporate relationships we have discovered are incredibly deeply entrenched. And I'm going to use the example of the Science Museum Group to talk about this. So the Science Museum Group has had relationships with three oil companies over the last few years, some stretching a long way back. Shell, um, which has sponsored several of its climate and energy exhibitions. BP, which it partners with on STEM work. Um, and Equinor, which obviously sponsors uh, Wonder Lab. And we took inspiration from our sister organizations in the US who've had a massive success in mobilizing scientists and kind of the staff of scientific institutions and scientific museums. Um, for example, they managed to push the American Museum of Natural History to both divest from fossil fuels and also remove one of the Koch brothers from its board. So that was really, really incredible. And that was very much driven by scientists um, from inside and outside the institutions. Um, so we, as Culture Unstained, um, decided that we would put together a formal complaint to the Science Museum, looking, you know, really zeroing in not just on these three companies' massive contributions um, to emissions, but also looking at their histories of denial and disinformation, as well as looking at what's considered good practice um, in fundraising ethics in the sector. Um, and we concluded that the Science Museum Group was breaking its own ethics policy with the lack of due diligence that it was doing around renewing uh, these relationships and that it was actually undermining its integrity as a scientific institution by continuing to partner with these companies and promote them in such an uncritical way. Um, this was supported um, by a, a very weighty list of nearly 50 scientists, including some people on this call today, um, lots of climate scientists, including Bill, um, we had like Stuart and Andrew and I think others from Scientists for Global Responsibility. We had some big names like James Hansen and Chris Packham. It got a lot of media coverage and attention. What did the Science Museum do? They completely brushed it off. They refused to engage. They didn't even do us the courtesy of giving us a formal response um, that engaged with the substance of our complaint on any level. Uh, but more than that, Ian Blatchford, the director of the Science Museum Group, really came out fighting. Um, so this is the quote that you can see here. He's told the FT um, in response to this controversy, even if the Science Museum were lavishly publicly funded, I would still want to have sponsorship from the oil companies. The museum is a much better museum and serves the public much better if it's engaging with the major players in society. Um, and this was because he'd written a letter to all staff um, kind of responding to the controversy explaining and I quote big oil and gas companies have the capital geography people and logistics to find the solutions to climate change and demonizing them is seriously unproductive he cited the extensive research that big energy groups conduct into technologies to reduce dependence on carbon as well as their funding of research at British universities and work on scenario planning Walking away is the easy and fruitless option, he said. Um, so, and he said a lot more than that as well in this letter. So I think this is a really good example of what some of the barriers to action and movement are on this issue. There are some you know, very entrenched corporate and financial interests at the top of a lot of these institutions um, that often strongly outstep with the rest of the staff and the rest of the sector that's definitely what we're seeing in the museum sector but nevertheless they hold the purse strings and they hold the power um, we also know that there's a lot of discomfort about these relationships with oil companies amongst science museum staff 
Um, but Blatchford's response to them was extremely forceful and he actually mentions junior colleagues in his letter saying, you know, he's, he wants to reassure junior colleagues and I think, you know, that leaves people with very real concerns about job security around speaking out on these kinds of issues um, and that's a very, very genuine problem, especially, you know, at the moment. Um, so, but it also shows that the fossil fuel industry's argument that they're driving the transition is clearly working in some influential circles. So in terms of, you know, what I'm really interested to get your thoughts on all of this, um, you know, what needs to happen for the scientific community to become collectively more outspoken on these issues, um, to support staff who are under pressure not to rock the boat, but feel very strongly. Um, help them push institutions to take a strong ethical line on the fossil fuel industry rather than having to sort of live with it in silence. So what can groups like Culture Unstained, like BP or Not BP, be doing to support and strengthen those who do want to speak out um, more effectively than we are doing at the moment? So that's what I'd really be interested to hear about. And, and just to conclude, you know, looking forward, these are obviously very challenging, very turbulent times um, in so many ways, but, but there is some positivity to be gained. And, you know, I, I'm sure you're all aware that the oil industry is now in an absolute existential crisis in a big beginnings of a death spiral, I would argue. Um, and that BP, Shell and Equinor are all desperately rebranding themselves as leaders of the energy transition. Um, and we have a really important role to play in debunking their spin, and especially when it relates to com, you know, com capture and storage, geoengineering, and so on. Um, the net zero rhetoric is really incredibly breathtaking, um, and it's designed to obscure the fact that they are all still actively planning to continue and expand exploration and production over the next few years, at least, if not beyond. And that's the reality of the situation. Um, the cultural sector is also in an existential crisis due to COVID, which is very, very heartbreaking. Um, big institutions like the British Museum and the Science Museum Group will survive, um, but making arguments that they should reject any sources of funding right now obviously has become a lot harder. Um, but I think one positive from the pandemic that, that seems to be the case, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, is that concern over climate change appears to remain as strong as ever, if not stronger. And so, you know, we can argue when the time is right that institutions shouldn't be trying to solve one problem, the problem of their financial instability, by fueling another one, climate breakdown. And this is very much about to come up because the British Museum is about to renew. Next year is the year when the British Museum decides whether it's going to renew its sponsorship relationship with BP. So it's going to be very much a live debate over the next few months. Let's see if we can put that question to the other panellists in the, in the few minutes that we've got left. I've, I've been terribly